Please turn in your Bibles to page 976. If you need a church Bible, um, do put your hand up and one will be brought to you. Uh, page, uh, page 976, that will take you back to Ephesians chapter 1, and especially verses 15 through 23, uh, which we'll be considering this morning. So Ephesians uh, reveals amazing things about the church, uh, what God has made the church to be, and what God's purpose is for the church. And hopefully over the coming weeks, and even today, and even in the weeks we've already had, we should be seeing things that are glorious that God is doing for the church, and how he is making the church as he wants the church to be. Uh, one thing the church should be is the church that knows what it has in Christ. And that's our sermon title this morning. The church that knows what it has in Christ. You know, it is a great thing when you know what you have it's a really, really good thing. So let's just think about that for a moment. Uh, imagine uh, you didn't know you had two homes. Or imagine uh, you did not know that you had three other cars. Or imagine you didn't know you had a holiday house somewhere. Or imagine, I know these are all inconceivable in a way, but imagine you didn't know you had a fourth bank account that was full of money. Or let's just imagine it slightly differently. Maybe you did know about them, but your understanding of them was wrong. So you knew you had a second house, but you thought it was a shed, really. That's what you thought it was. Or you knew you had three other cars, but really you just thought they were scraps. And a bunch of metal. Or you knew that you had a holiday home, but you thought it was a rundown beach hut somewhere. Or maybe you did know you had a fourth bank account, but you thought it had no money in it. That would be sad, wouldn't it? That, that would be really sad to go through life with those misconceptions. That would be a sad way to live your life. Uh, not knowing what you possess and own. Well, Paul doesn't want the Ephesian church to do that. He wants them to really know what they have and they own in Jesus Christ. Now remember, Paul has reminded the Ephesians uh, what they do have. In Jesus Christ. We've been looking at it, haven't we, the last few weeks from uh, verse 3 to verse 14. We've seen a wonderful picture. Paul has been praising God and explaining to the Ephesian church and to us what we have in Jesus Christ. We have election. We have redemption, him buying us. We have forgiveness. We have adoption brought into God's family. We have the Holy Spirit given to us. What wealth, what possessions the church has. And because they have those blessings, Paul prays that they will know what they have. That's how Paul starts from verse 15. Do you see there? He says, for this reason. He's referring back to what has already been explained to the church. He says, for this reason, because I have heard of your faith and love in the Lord Jesus Christ. But it, he isn't talking so much about their faith and their love. Those are indicators, lovely indicators, that they have the possessions of Christ, that they have all these things. And he says, because I know you have these things, for this reason, I pray that you would know you have them. That's what he goes on to say, doesn't he? Verse 16, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit or a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge 
of him. That knowledge is a personal knowledge. It's a knowledge not just of the head, but it's a knowledge of the heart, of experience. He wants the church to know personally their God and all that they have in him. He goes on, verse 18, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. He purposely mentions the heart because the heart was the place of both thinking and feeling. And he wants that to be illuminated and highlighted by God himself. For what reason? That you may know. Again, not just an intellectual knowing, a real emotional, experiential, personal knowing. And then he goes on and names three things that he really wants the church in Ephesus to know in this way. That's what Paul is praying for here. And this is what God wants for us also at Hillfields Church Coventry. So let's just think this morning about these three realities that Paul wants us to know that we have. And the first one that he wants us to know is that we have... A hope. The church has a hope. We see that, don't we, in verse 18. That's what he wants. He says, Having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. So this hope isn't wishful thinking, it is certainty about future realities. That's what this hope is that God gives to us. And these realities are rooted in the promises of God. Every day, the church lives with hope. We have a living, pulsing, thriving hope. And we have this hope whether we feel we have it or not. And we have this hope whether we feel we understand it or not. But Paul prays that the church would feel and understand it because it is ours now, right now. Paul describes this hope in a particular way in verse 18. He says, it's the hope to which God has called you. Near the end of verse 18, the hope to which God has called you. Another way of saying it is, it is the hope of his calling. The hope of God's calling. This is a hope that only exists because God calls the church to himself. And the moment God calls, the hope exists in your life at that moment. So you see, the hope and the call go together. You can't separate them in your life. So imagine, I don't know how many of you here have been to the local big hospital and sat in a waiting room there. Uh, You might have had an appointment slip come through the post. Some waiting rooms are far bigger than this room here. There can be loads and loads and loads of people there in the hospital waiting. Sometimes you wait one hour. You wait two hours, you wait three hours, and at some point you start losing hope. You think they've forgotten you. You really do come to a place where you say, what's going on here? And then out comes the nurse or the doctor, and they stand there and they call your name. And suddenly you have hope. Yes, I'm not forgotten. And you follow the doctor and the nurse and they sit you down and they say, wait here. And they go in the door. And yes, you're still waiting. But now you have hope. You wait with hope because you've been called. You've been named. Well, that's what it is. That's what you have. If you're trusting in Jesus Christ, you've been called and you have hope. The church of God is a called Church, He speaks into our night and calls us to himself. He calls us out of rebellion, out of sin, out of darkness, out of shame, into his presence. And each believer here has been called by God. 
just like Lazarus was. Do you remember Lazarus? He was dead in the tomb four days. And Jesus stood and he said, roll back the stone. And then he said, Lazarus, he spoke, he called him and he had to come. You had to come when God called you. And Lazarus came out into life and light. He came out into hope. God calls you just like he did when he spoke the world into creation. He said, let there be light. And there had to be light. He spoke it and it was. That's the same way he called you. Listen to how Paul puts it into Corinthians. Because we see here that in God's calling, he promises to you a deeper knowledge of himself. 2 Corinthians 4 says this, For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Do you see that? It's a powerful calling that you cannot resist and it invites you to know God more deeply. This call also gives deep certainty about the future. Listen to how Paul puts it in Romans. He says, and those whom he predestined who he chose beforehand, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Here Paul is speaking in the past tense. All of these are past realities in a way. He's saying they're so certain. They're, they're, they're a line that cannot be broken. They're a chain that is inseparable. If you are called, you will be glorified. If you've been born again, made alive, if you've been called, you have hope. And it's hope of certain future realities. To be called pours a glorious hope into our lives. The church should be a place full of hope, even in our trials. And yes, we have trials. People are going through trials. But in our trials, we are to be people full of hope by God's grace. We're to know about certain future certainties and we're to believe in them and anticipate them. Biblical hope is future certainty, not wishful thinking. And the church has hope. What else did Paul want the church in Ephesus to truly understand? Well, he wanted them to know the church has a glorious inheritance. We see that, don't we, in verse 18. Let's read it again. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know, dot, 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 what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. That's the second thing that Paul is praying that the church really knows in a deep way their glorious inheritance. Notice it's a shared inheritance. It's an inheritance in the saints. We are not people that are building up some kind of personal spiritual fortune. We are in this together. We, we, we are looking forward to the same glorious inheritance. We will see that is, that is Jesus Christ and all that is in him. But we're, we're going together and we're pulling together. It's not like we're anticipating or waiting for separate things. No, God has made his church to have one glorious inheritance together. I just want us to focus on one aspect of this inheritance and, 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 and take it in this morning. And that is simply that Jesus is our inheritance and we are his now we know, we've been looking at that wonderful section in chapter, in, in chapter 1, verse 3 through 14, and we know that there are so many glorious things, but they come to us in the person of Jesus, and he is our inheritance, and incredibly, we are his. And that's brought out really in verse 22 and 23. Let's read that. 
He says, and God put all things under Jesus' feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. And here's the description of the church, which is his body. And here's another description, which is the fullness of him who fills all in all. So Paul describes the church as the fullness of of Jesus. Later on, we'll see another kind of meaning for fullness in the rest of the letter. But here, Paul uses the word fullness to show in some mysterious way, we, the church, complete Jesus. That's staggering. We are his fullness. Now, we know that Jesus lacks nothing. And he needs No one. He is totally perfect and complete. He is fully God. That's why Paul can say he fills all in all. No one can add to Jesus. However, Jesus has willingly become head of the church. We're described as the body. And although here in this passage, When it talks about him as the head, it talks about him as head over everything. We know from the rest of the Bible that he is the head of the church, the body. And Jesus willingly becomes head of the church and he willingly makes us his body. He has created an unbreakable union between himself and the church. That's what he's done. And now he waits for that union to be perfected and totally completed. And he waits for his glory to be fully revealed in the church and given to her. And we, the saviour and the saved, in that day shall be complete when that happens. So Christ will not be complete without his church home with him and glorified in him. Now he's given us other pictures in the Bible just to drive this point home. And we will be familiar with some of those pictures. So the Bible describes Jesus as the shepherd. And what are we? We're the sheep. <laughs> the shepherd is not complete without the sheep, neither the sheep without the shepherd. They go together, they make a unit. That's what God has done in his grace. Jesus is described as the vine, <laughs> and we are the branches. They have to go together. Jesus is described as the bridegroom and the church is the bride and they are complete in union. And that is the day that we are waiting for. That is the inheritance we have as the church. Intimate knowledge of our saviour and all that is his. It is staggering grace and commitment from Jesus that he has done this and that he has committed himself to us in this way. So our inheritance is so long and so wide and so deep and so high. It is so huge that Paul says to the church, are you thinking about it? Do you understand your inheritance? I'm praying that you would know it in this deeper way. Do you spend time thinking through what it means That God can say, when we can say, my beloved is mine and I am his. Does this knowledge thrill us? Does it change our choices in life? Does it shape the way we wait for Jesus to come, knowing this is our inheritance? You know, the story is told of a, of a man back in the 1880s in America. And he had come into a huge fortune that was waiting for him in New York City. And so he takes the carriage uh, to New York City and he's going along in the carriage and he's approaching New York. And the streets are muddy and it's begun to rain and a storm is coming. It's cutting up the mud and the rocks. And as he goes along, the carriage goes over a rock and it breaks the axle and the wheel comes off. And he's there in the pouring rain and storm and he gets out 
And he walks over and he kicks the wheel of the carriage. And the driver, who knows his situation, uh, simply says to him, why are you kicking the wheel when you know what awaits you just two miles down the road? You could even walk it in the rain. Surely this storm and rain must be put in the perspective of what is just over the hill. Well, are you kicking the wheel? Are you tempted to kick the wheel in your life? You know, we are all just a few miles from a breathtaking inheritance. Just a few miles. It doesn't matter how old or young you are. We know that life is so short and passing. The oldest person in this room still feels like their youth was yesterday. So short is life. Paul prays that the church would know its inheritance and that that would change and affect their life. Thirdly, the final thing this morning that Paul wanted the church to know more deeply was that the church has power. Let's look at that in verse 15, uh, verse 18, sorry again, having the eyes of your, um, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know, dot, 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 verse 19, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe. Now Paul goes out of his way to underline just how great and massive this power is. First, he describes it as immeasurably great. And then in verse 19, he goes on to list four power words just to underline it. So there's the, the word power itself. He says, towards us who believe, according to the working, that's a power word, like energy, of his great might. Those are all words that relate to power in the Greek. And Paul purposely uses them all because he wants us to get a grasp of how great the power is. And who is this power available for? Is it for the cool? Is it for the strong? Is it for the trendy and the wise? No, incredibly, it's simply for those who believe. Weak little Christians like you and me. Verse 19. Immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, who have faith in Jesus. This great power is available to you. But does the church believe such power is ours. Do we believe that? You know, it's so easy to doubt that such power is available to us. You know, when you doubt God's love for you, when you're struggling to believe that God loves you, where does the Bible encourage us to look? Well, it tells us to look at the cross, doesn't it? It says, look at the cross, look at the love of Jesus. Look at what he has done and do not doubt that he loves you. Well, what is the Christian to do when we doubt that such power is available to us? Well, Paul says we're to look at the grave and know that it's empty. That's what he says, doesn't he? In verse 18, uh, 19 and 20. He says, the greatness of this power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Paul says, that's the example of God's power. An empty grave that the world cannot deny. He says, go on even further. Continue to look as Jesus rises up into glory. There is not only an empty grave, but there is an occupied throne. This is the power of God. God. 
Paul describes that place as being at the right hand of God in the heavenly places. That description, right hand and heavenly places, that is not a description uh, of physical location. They are statements of power. They are wanting you to understand the power of Jesus Christ. He's at the right hand of God. He has all the power of God. All power is given to Jesus Christ. He is at the right hand of the Father. He is in the heavenly places spiritually. He is above all other powers that can be named, Paul says. He has dominion over them all. He has authority over them all, whether they are visible or invisible, whether they are temporary or eternal. Jesus Christ rules. Paul says he is head over everything, verse 22. And God put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things. Now we know that Jesus is head of the church, but here Paul says he is also head over all things. He is master and Lord over all things. For what? For the church. He is head over all things for the church. What a place of power that places the church. That the one who is over everything is for us. He rules for our benefit. Even more than that, in chapter 2, verse 6, we are told that he raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's where we are spiritually, in the place of power, with our Saviour. If God is for us, who can be against us, says Paul. So how is this power to show itself in the church? How are we to see it? And there's two ways, primary ways, that God is looking for his power to be shown in the church. And the first one is the power to do God's will. Do you struggle to do God's will? Yes, I struggle to do God's will. I must not believe the lie that there is not power to do God's will. Jesus modeled this for us himself. Listen to what he said in John chapter 10. He says, for this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own will. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. Why? This command I have received from my Father. That's why I have power in this situation, because I am doing my Father's will. There is power available to do His will. The church has power to do the will of Jesus Christ. There isn't power to do our own thing and to do our own agendas and go our own way. There's not power for that. There isn't power to seek after supernatural events that are not found in God's will. It is power to obey. How else is this power to be seen in the life of the church? Well, the second way is it is power to suffer and endure for Christ. Power to do this, to suffer and endure for Christ. In Colossians chapter 1, Paul says this using very similar language to Ephesians. He says, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. There's that knowledge again that Paul is crying out that the churches know. Knowledge of their God, knowledge of his will on a deep level, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. What for? For all endurance and patience with joy. 
The power of God in the church is not primarily for miracles. It is for endurance with joy, which is a miracle. To endure with joy is the power of Christ in me. Just imagine with me for a moment, would you, uh, two vehicles, a, a kind of Humvee, a military Jeep, a Humvee, they're called. Big wheels, broad body, built for going over rough and tough terrain and land. And imagine a Formula One racing car. Now, both have power. But if the terrain and the land before you is rocky, and it's mountainous, and it's muddy, and it's got rivers and valleys, it's going to be a deep trial in that way, then you cannot depend on the power of the racing car. It will not reveal power in the way you need. You need to experience the power of the Humvee. You cannot trust in your own power in difficult situations. It will prove itself useless. But there is a power in our trials and difficulties, the power of God. And when we trust in God and when we know that power is available, then there is the potential to experience that over the mountains, down through the valleys, through the rivers, in the mud. You will see God's power in your life. You will feel the power of God in your life. You will know the power of God. What for? To endure, to endure, to be patient. To go through it with joy. This is the experience God calls us to in Christ. That's the experience that Paul discovered and knew. He cried out for deliverance and God said, my grace is sufficient for you. And Paul came to say, when I am weak, then I am strong. There is power to endure. There is power to suffer. There is power to overcome sin. Do not believe the devil's lie. You have no power. It is just that the power is not yours. It is Christ's in you. That's the power. We are weak and broken people. And every time we depend on ourselves, that's what we will discover. But the Bible says there is awesome power for those who believe. Many are suffering in our church. Many are. Many are going through deep waters. Maybe you are saying, how can I know this power? Well, I believe that Paul offers us one answer here. And the answer is prayer. Prayer. Isn't that what Paul does here? He prays that they will know these things. Not just in their head, but he prays they will know them in their life. That's what he's pleading with God for. That the church would know these things. And so the curtain is pulled back, really, on Paul's prayer life here in verse 15 and 16 and 17. He says in verse 15, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards the saints... I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. What does Paul reveal? What does the curtain pull back reveal of Paul's prayer life? Well, it reveals three simple things. It reveals constant prayer. He's constantly praying. 
His life is a life of prayer. It's a life of prayer that is filled with thankfulness. Paul will never stop thanking God for what he knows is true. That is so important. That's an expression of faith in the deepest and darkest of times. The Christian is to thank God. There is power in praise. It is an expression of faith. In all things, Paul says, give thanks. There is power in praise. And then the third thing is there is longing. There is pleading. He cries out to God for what he knows only God can do and give. Please, Lord, give them this knowledge. Help them to see. May they know. You know, if the curtain were pulled back on our prayer lives, what would we see? What would we see? My prayer life would not match up to Paul's if you pull back the curtain on my prayer life. What happens if the curtain is pulled back on your prayer life? Are we praying? When we become desperate and weak, what happens at that moment when we are desperate and weak? Are we drawn to prayer or do we run from prayer? What about us as a church family? Are we a praying church? Do we pray for each other in the way that Paul is praying here? Do you know people that are going through difficult times? Are you praying for them in this way? Are you pleading with God that they might know? They might know him in this situation, that God would be gracious, that he would cause them to endure. Are we praying for one another like this? Are we praying for the lost? Do we pray for them? Are we constant in that? Do we plead? Do we long for them to know? Yes, the people at the table of the children's talk, the rude and the nasty, do you pray for them with a pleading? Because you are rude and nasty, I am rude and nasty and God had mercy on me. Does my prayer overflow to others? There is power in prayer, but we need to be praying. Do we pray for the word of God that is continually being sown in the lives of people, whether it's from here or whether it's in the ministries and the groups of the church or whether it's in personal outreach that people have in their workplaces? Do we pray for the church body? Do we say, Lord, bless the word that is being sown? We pray that people would know you through it. Is this our heart as a church? Or what are we doing? Do we trundle along and all sorts of other priorities just drown it out and kill it off? Paul says, the word of God says, there is power for the believer. And we need to be praying. There is power in prayer. So the church has hope. The church has a hope. It's a living hope. We're to know it every day of our life. The church has an inter- inheritance. It's a glorious inheritance. May it impact our decisions every day of our life. The church has power. 